Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode 42 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this week's episode, I have a chat with Tina Dietz, who is an award-winning and internationally acclaimed speaker, audiobook publisher, podcast producer, and content marketing expert who's been featured on media outlets including ABC, Huffington Post, and Forbes. Tina's podcast, The Start Something Show, was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 35 podcasts for entrepreneurs, and her company, Start Something Creative Business Solutions, connects leaders, entrepreneurs, and experts with larger audiences resulting in expanded influence and income. I had the privilege of meeting Tina via a colleague from the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, and I was quite pleased to speak with her about audiobooks, one of her many areas of specialty. In terms of a personal update, this past weekend, the weekend of October 5th through the 7th, I was in Montreal, Quebec, which is about six to seven hours away from Waterloo, Ontario, where I live. And I was there for the book launch of my new book, Macabre Montreal, Ghostly Tales, Ghastly Events, and Gruesome True Stories, a, a book that I co-authored with Shana Krishnasamy, and Shana and I used to work together at Kobo, and we still had the privilege of working together on this book, even after I left Kobo. I had originally been planning on attending that same weekend the Night of the Writing Dead event in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that was hosted by Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon of the Career Author Podcast. You may remember that I interviewed them both in episode 21 of this show. Jay and Zach, who've hosted the Authors on a Train and many other collaborative writing weekends and trips for authors, we're doing this Night of the Writing Dead weekend uh, during a special anniversary of the classic George A. Romero Night of the Living Dead film, and it was done in the town where the movie was shot. I had been so looking forward to and so excited uh, to both be able to meet them in person and also to attend this event as a writer, and I, and I booked relatively early as soon as they announced it. Now, of course, when Shana and I started planning out the book launch for Macabre Montreal, I soon came to the horror... <laughs> realization that I had committed to every single weekend in October already. Now that happens to me almost every single October. It's a combination of being a horror author who's in demand during the Halloween season, but also uh, part of the regular travel and speaking that I do at various conferences and venues. And so it happened that the only weekend in October where I had some flexibility was that luxury slash fun weekend I had registered and paid for with Jay and Zach. Now, having already had to bail on getting a chance to meet them in person last summer at the Selmore Book Show Summit in Chicago, uh, because that same weekend I had a paying gig in Toronto, and money coming in always wins out over pleasure, I I felt terrible about it. So I uh, offered my paid membership for that weekend, uh, Night of the Writing Dead, so that one of their other podcast listeners who was interested in attending could participate with the registration paid for. Uh, I thought that would be an easier thing to do to give it away. Now, the person who won would still have to pay to get to Pittsburgh if they were from out of town, but at least the registration was covered, and that would give the winner a bit of flexibility for accommodations, meals, etc., etc. And what I love is that um, during the contest that they were running on the Career Author podcast, they called it the Mark Leslie Lefebvre R.I.P., memorial ticket. I love that sense of humor. So thanks, Jay. Thanks, Zach. Looks like uh, it was a fantastic weekend. I'm sorry to have missed it, but I'm so glad to see that you and the many writers who attended had such a good time. And while that was going on, as I mentioned, I was in Montreal for the book launch of Macabre Montreal, and it went great. Shane and I did a book signing on the Friday night at the Chapters in Point Claire. 
and that's sort of on the western, uh, northwestern uh, part of the greater city of Montreal. And uh, and I left, uh, we left a single signed copy in, in the store in our wake, and apparently it didn't last long, because uh, when we checked stock, it was it was gone the next day. Um, then on uh, Sunday, we did a signing at the downtown Indigo, again leaving a single signed copy behind that sold out relatively quickly after we left. It was great being there at the bookstores and speaking with so many people and meeting the staff at the stores, talking to the folks who were delighted to see there was a book of ghost stories about Montreal, finally, because it is the first of its kind, and uh, friends who came to visit, Shana and I, and, and Barnaby, of course, because my skeleton, Barnaby, was there too. Uh, it was great chatting with people about the book. Now, after the Sunday evening signing, the good folks at Haunted Montreal met us at the Indigo downtown and did a complimentary mini ghost walk tour of three of the nearby downtown locations that were included in their tours and also included in the book Macabre Montreal. It was amazing fun. Always great to go on a historic ghost walk. And what a great way to sort of round out that weekend. While Liz and I were in town, we also did some fun exploring of the city. We explored um, the the Mount Royal Cemetery, which is 343 acres, and we, we spent a great time there exploring the uh, cemetery, as well as exploring some of the craft beer places that existed in Montreal. Lots of great fun. I... Uh, I am, though, however, uh, because of all the travel uh, and extracurricular activities I've been doing, I'm a little bit behind in all the things that I need to get done, uh, part of my regular schedule, which includes recording chapters for the audio version of my book, The Seven P's of Publishing Success, which came out in September. Now, I'll be posting one of those chapters to Patreon for my Patreon supporters to enjoy at patreon.com slash starkreflections with a special shout out and thank you to my Patreon supporters for believing in me enough to offer a monthly contribution to help pay for my time in producing this weekly podcast. Your support and your generosity means so much to me. Thank you very much. Now, speaking of the audio file I'm going to be posting there, it's one of the chapters that's almost ready to roll, and I've gotten some great tech feedback on improving the quality of the recordings from Wes at Findaway Voices. And Find Away Voices is where I'll be distributing the book through to all the major retailers and libraries, etc. And hopefully next week I'll get back on track with recording more of those chapters. Now you can find out more about Find Away Voices, who are the sponsor of this episode, and how you can use them to either find professional narrators and have a professionally produced audiobook, or, if you prefer, use them for distribution into hundreds of audio markets around the globe in a way that allows you to set and control the price. And you can find out more about them at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Now, speaking of the seven P's of publishing success, I'd like to uh, do a special shout-out to Craig Martell of the 20 Books to 50K group and conference. Um, On the group on Facebook this past week, Craig did uh, an unexpected and very generous thing. He did an offering of uh, 50 copies of the ebook giveaway where he purchased 50 copies of the book for the first 50 claimants. Now, due to Craig's generosity and the follow-on sales that happened uh, in this wake, the title hit into the top 20s of the authorship and writing categories on Amazon, and I got to see it sitting alongside Joanna Penn's How to Write Nonfiction, a great book, and Writer's Market 2018, and Writer's Market has been one of those guides I started reading back in the early 90s when I wanted to start submitting my writing out there. So it was a real honor for me to be sitting uh, with such prestigious titles that I adore and admire. So thank you, Craig. As mentioned on the Facebook group, I owe you a delicious craft beer when I see you in Vegas in November. But that's enough about me and my personal updates. Let's get on with the main topic for the show, my interview with Tina Dietz. Tina, thank you so much for joining me here today. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, the first thing I want to talk to, there's so many things to talk about, and I know we're going to dig into audio, but I want to go back to um, your, your background and, and talk about the, the work that you do with business professionals and, and the link between writing and entrepreneurship, which I think 
you believe strongly in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's a strong link between expression and entrepreneurship. Most entrepreneurs, well, actually, I can't think of any entrepreneur who didn't become an entrepreneur for any other reason except that they had to do something in a certain way. They had a vision that they felt like they had to fulfill. It's like a compulsion. Um, I think Michael Gerber calls it a uh, entrepreneurial seizure. And I think that's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> a really good way of putting it. So I think there's a tremendous link between the two. And particularly with writing, because writing is such an enduring format, as opposed to even podcasting or audio or video, which you know you tend to listen to once and then move on from. If you've got something written, particularly as a book, particularly as a hard copy book, it's a constant reminder for people. And it's um, a tangible piece of um, really what ends up being somebody's legacy. Okay, cool. Cool. Now, the the thing uh, I'm really intrigued in, one of the reasons I reached out to you is because I saw the support that you give to authors who are looking to get their books into audio. Uh, now, I want to start off with what was your introduction into the world of podcasting and audio? Where did that start? Well, my introduction into podcasting came from a number of lovely, warm introductions I had from colleagues to be on other people's podcasts. And, you know, I have a running joke that uh, I love the sound of my own voice. It's something we talk about. And there's, I think there's a lot of, I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone in that. There's a lot of people out there who can't stand the sound of their own voice, but I'm one of the lucky ones, I guess. So, um, so that's a running joke I've always had. And that kind of led me down the path of podcasting, having my own show. And, you know, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I was one of those kids that was sitting there with my boom box in the 1980s, like re- making my own recordings and mixtapes and pretending to be a DJ and stuff like that. So, <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Yeah. You, uh, now, you speaking of which, you have advice for authors who don't like the sound of their own voice or, or, or recorders, et cetera. What, what do you usually um, tell them? Yeah, uh, well, I actually do a lot of training with with authors and professionals about their own speaking voice, getting their message out there. And and it's an interesting combination of inner work and outer work. So I actually wrote an article for Forbes a while back called Do You Sound Like a Leader? And went through these different factors that have been shown via research, uh, vocal qualities that are associated with how you're viewed as a leader. Uh, Things like tempo, fluidity, articulation, um, sonority and, and the like. And there's, you know, pretty simple ways that if you don't like the sound of your own voice, first of all, a lot of it is getting used to the sound of your own voice because naturally, just biologically, our voices sound different inside of our head than they do on a recording. Okay. It's because of the resonance of our own skulls. <laughs> and <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. So you kind of have to get used to it. it it's a little bit of a muscle. That's that's okay. one part. The second part is is there maybe if some things that you can do to enhance the quality of your voice that would allow you to be more comfortable with it. Most of it actually starts with breathing and uh, and breath work, any type of singing, uh, vocal narration of any kind. A lot of people who do uh, you know professional voice work of any kind, whether they're on the radio or they're on television or they're professional narrators, all of them are steeped in different techniques around the breath, breathing, and even facial exercises and things like that. It's an instrument. Facial exercises as well. Facial exercises, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a lot of musculature going on there. So there's all kinds of things you can do. And and even when it comes down to food, like I'm I'm terrible about drinking coffee before I get on the air, and you're really not supposed to do that. But I do do it anyway. (laughs) Oops, he says taking a sip from his coffee. let me have some coffee. Oh, really? So uh, coffee actually does have a, uh, an effect on, on what the vocal cords of the throat or how, do, how does that work? Yeah, and it can cause some d- restriction. Um, dairy, of course, is fairly obvious uh, as yeah. an issue. Um, sometimes citrus juice, orange juice and things like that can cause extra um, phlegm. Okay. Anything that's kind of mucus causing is it's not great before you get on a microphone. Right. <laughs> it kind of depends on your, on your tolerance. So, you know, coffee and a bagel and cream cheese, probably not a good idea oh, before you, okay. you hit a microphone okay. uh, in, any, in any particular <laughs> case. 
Here's some, here's some all kinds of cool tricks. That's fantastic. Uh, lemon water is one of the ones I heard that actually. Uh, lemon water in well. general for people, as long as you don't kind of overdo it, is is as long as it's fresh lemon, is okay. uh, always lovely. But again, you want to leave a little space between doing citrus and speaking many oh. times because you might cough some stuff up because the citrus breaks up mucus. Right. Well, so, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've never said mucus this many times in an interview before. So that's, I, that's, I actually yeah. like the space between citrus and speaking. That sounds almost like a mini book that. Uh, Ooh, the space between citrus <laughs> and speaking. How to stay fresh in today's world. So you offer uh, authors coaching and consulting and how to get audiobooks ready, but you also um, uh, help them get ready for, you know, podcasts and radio interviews. What are, what are some of the top tips that you usually like to, to share with authors about that? Well, podcasting is such a, a huge opportunity for any, any business person who has a message that they want to share, but podcasting works differently than other media. And that is usually where most people miss the opportunity. Because unlike other forms of media like television and, um, well, traditional radio, where you're de dealing with a media personality who is usually employed by another company, okay. podcasts are run by the person who's running their own enterprise. They're generally entrepreneurs of one brand, one type or another. Right. And so podcast hosts for a guest are your potential colleagues. Okay. And so whereas, you know, normally you wouldn't follow up and have additional conversations with someone you're, say, being interviewed by on CNN, necessarily, a podcast host is somebody that you definitely want to develop a relationship with. We're all influencers. We all like to connect people. We all like to have conversations. So if you're looking just to be on a show and kind of be one and done is a huge missed opportunity for anybody who's a guest. So I work a lot with people to not only develop their message, hone their voice around their beginning on more podcasts, but we actually have a whole system of getting authors on more podcasts consistently over time and then having a, a relationship, building relationships with the hosts that they ended up being on shows with. And we can even take it a step further and develop an entire evergreen marketing engine just with the podcasting content. It's pretty cool. Oh, that is awesome. And then yeah. on, the, on the flip side, you also have a, a package I saw in, in consulting or coaching to help someone who is interested in starting their own podcast. I mean, probably from the point of, should you do it? Yes. <laughs> uh, so what are, what are some of the considerations there? Uh, you know, I, it's, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, sometimes I, I talk people out of having their own podcast more than having them many okay. times. No, no. Why, why is that? Uh, it, it is a considerable effort and it is a deep commitment. Um, most pod people who jump into podcasting last five to seven episodes and then stop. Right. Pod once fading. they really realize pod fading. Yes. Yeah. I love that term. Yeah. Once they realize the amount of work that it takes. So when we do a podcast launch, it's not just about the technical back end, which, you know, we take out of people's hands right. and it, it really is about the, strategic planning longer term for the content because the days of you know having somebody it used to be that people would say well give me your 10 questions and then they would just read the questions and that would be the podcast and you don't see too many of those around anymore you have to be an excellent interviewer like you yeah. you've got to have a deep pocket of expertise and because it's got to be interesting it's got to be entertaining it's got to it has to be engaging because there's just too many options for people. Um, they need to, they need to be hooked by, as, by who you are as a host, first and foremost. As well as the guests, because that way it's not, as you said, it's not just a list of question after question. Right. It's a unique conversation between two personalities. So you, for example, could be a guest on my podcast as well as four other podcasts this week, but it's going to be completely unique conversations derived from your expertise. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and what the audience needs. It's right. all about serving the audience. And that's where a lot of guest experts get hooked up is they're like, they want to be on and promote their book. Well, in my <laughs> book, I talk about the seven <laughs> steps to such and such. You got to stop that. Just right. stop it. Don't do that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Now, the other thing I'm very intrigued by is you, you say that you, you support them on the technical back end. What, is, what does that entail? Like what are oh, the well, things you do for them? Yeah, yeah. So the, the podcasting world is always changing. And one of the things that I got tripped up on and why I outsourced my own podcast launch years ago when I did it 
was because I knew if I had to wade through the how to do A, B, C, D in, in technology wise, I wasn't going to do it. Okay. I wasn't going to do it. But, uh, and I still partner uh, with the company that launched my original show, Cashflow Podcasting. They are fantastic people. And we actually developed a partnership because we had a fan, such a great relationship. And um, that's where I, I learned all the technology and all the back end of how to get a podcast up and running, how to make sure that everything is positioned correctly, that you're making use of all the different fields and pieces, say on iTunes or uh, the different places you can submit a show to. Uh, everything from iHeartRadio to Stitcher and Google Play and, and how, all it, how it all fits together okay. as an industry and as a, as a technology. So it's just, you know, people can end up running things on their own if they want to, but it's nice to just be the talent sometimes. Okay. That is, uh, th- that's yeah. fantastic. I love that. I want to go um, a little bit, uh, back up a little bit and move over from podcasting into audiobooks because yes. again, that's an area where you support authors. So what are, what are some of the current trends that uh, you've seen in, in the audiobook industry that authors may not be familiar with? Yeah, I've, a lot of authors that I run into, um, a lot of bi- really smart business people and Slightly more disturbingly, a lot of publishers have absolutely no idea how massive audiobooks have become as an industry. I mean, it's, it's going to break $3.5 billion in sales this year. <laughs> and, and that is not a new trend. It's been going on now for half a dozen years. Double digit growth every single year, year upon year, fastest segment of the publishing industry. And it's, it's really because of the accessibility of audio. Okay. You can you can listen to audio when you can't be reading. You can listen to audio when you can't be watching video. So it's just available all the time, and it's not new. You know, we've been before we had had it in our pockets on our cell phones. We had it on CD before we had it on CD. We had it on tape before we had it on tape. We had it on albums. Yes. <laughs> First audio book was published, I think, in 1929, 1930. Oh wow! So yeah, it's a really enduring format. So it's it doesn't occur for people as a fad because it's okay. not. Because it's just like this growth. So I guess for authors who are, are, you know, they're looking at it and saying, well, I have an ebook, I have a print book out. What are some of the considerations that they would um, look at or ask themselves before moving into the audiobook space? The biggest thing is, are they willing to make the most of it? Um, I, I've been building businesses for decades. And the thing that always strikes me is that you're, Anything that you create needs to be an asset, not a burden. Okay. So if you want to create an audiobook, you want to have it be part of a larger picture. Like where, what do you want your book to do for you? Okay. What results do you want the book to produce? Because as most authors find out, just publishing a book doesn't mean your book sells. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, of course. So most of the time when someone's coming to me for an audiobook, it's one of, two reasons. One is that they're launching a new book and they know the popularity of audiobooks and they want to make sure the format is available. And the second reason is that they feel like their book needs some fresh life breathed into it. And it's something they've published previously and they're either doing a second edition or they want to just revive it. They were like, you know what? I didn't know what I was doing when I launched this the first time. Okay. I want to have something fresh happen. Let's do an audiobook and basically relaunch the book using the audiobook as the opportunity to get the word out there. And that's going to be really effective. Okay. And you, so you do this sort of uh, work um, and support for authors, uh, I guess, independent authors, as well as publishers, I, from what I've yeah. read. Yeah. yeah, we do, we, we do uh, partner with uh, publishers who don't have their own audio division to basically provide uh, an audio division for them. Okay. Well, and, yeah. and there was this, uh, I, want, I want to make sure that we uh, talk about the free download that you have on your website and uh, where people can get it because uh, you've got some great tips for, for writers. So um, how, how does one get that? Oh, yeah, that's, um, we wanted to demystify the audiobook process. Because again, people get tripped up in the details, right? So yeah. just really clearly outlining, these are all the steps it takes to do it. Here's the pros and cons. This is what you need to look at. So you can find that, that uh, guide that we created for you at launchyouraudiobook.com. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
Cool. Now, uh, the beautiful thing about digital, uh, we have not yet met in person, although we've spoken a, a few times. Uh, we're in completely different countries, and you're in a, a pretty, um, pretty uh, tropical place compared to where I am up here in the cold of Canada. Uh, how, <laughs> how did Costa Rica come about? Oh, geez. Costa Rica, um, about, well, it's actually almost exact five years today, actually. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, happy I just anniversary. That. <laughs> happy anniversary. Five years today. Yeah, we sold our house, we sold our stuff, and we moved to Costa Rica, mostly because we could. Okay. It was, I wanted to, I'd been preaching the freedom lifestyle for years and took some time. Um, a lot of the work I do on the coaching side uh, with professionals and leaders is having them step into the life they really want and how that dovetails with their business. So it all has to kind of go together. And, you know, being someone who, you know, it's important to walk your talk, right? Okay. So that was part of my whole five-year plan to move to Costa Rica as a good starting point to free up the family, to be completely free of debt, um, and, and have a lifestyle where we could be more together as a family rather than focusing on accumulating more stuff. Okay. So that's, that's was kind of the reasoning behind it. And uh, I had some contacts down there and did some research. And let me tell you, people who live down in Costa Rica who are expats are such raving fans. It is not difficult. I mean, I was invited into people's homes. I was invited out to dinner. Like, oh my God, you're new to the area. Let's get together. You know, and so it was fantastic. It was kind of like adult summer camp. Sounds almost like the uh, it sounds almost like the division that's going on in the U.S. and has been growing and growing over the years. Everyone just needs to go hang out at Costa Rica for a little while, right? And yeah, go and chill out. Be friends just again. Chill out. All right. Yeah, well. be friends again. <laughs> that's fantastic. That would actually be very helpful, I think. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> so, when it comes to audiobook production, how do you how does somebody decide what to outsource, what to do themselves? Like, what are the what are those factors involved? Well, there's a couple of of consideration certainly uh, one of them is how valuable is your time and so if you are a professional who is billing out at you know hundreds of dollars an hour and you you want to you want to look at outsourcing because there's a there's a learning curve right there's a lot of work involved and the other question is, you know, I get all the time is, do you narrate the book yourself or do you have somebody else narrate it? That's a whole other set of questions to be asking yourself. So there's that world of it. Okay. And then there's the, the world of, well, what don't you know that is going to end up delaying the process? So at bare minimum, you want to do your due, dil due diligence on the process and what's involved. That's why I created that, uh, that download, that guide. Okay. The second thing is, well, what is your budget? Because audiobooks, the cost of producing an audiobook is largely based on how long it is. So a lot of fiction authors are going to find that with a 100,000 word book, which is going to turn into a 10 hour audiobook, that their cost of production is going to be higher than someone with a nonfiction book that's say 40,000 words. Okay. And so those are just some different considerations to take a look at. And there's ways to work with that, right? We're creative people. Nothing is hard and fast. Nothing is, <laughs> there's no like line in the sand that says you shall not pass this line if you have this kind of book or this kind of situation. So it's really a matter of doing due diligence. So most of my time with my authors, because my team handles the production side of things, my time with authors is all spent in consulting and advising with them. Okay. And I can do that freely because the, one of the hallmarks of our company is we never take our author's royalties royalties belong completely 100% to the author. So we're free to act as advocates and, you know, be in your corner to make sure that you're getting exactly what you need and um, pull back the curtain on anything you want, whether it's on the production side or the marketing side or the speaking side. So it's basically, it's uh, being able to rely on your expertise, support and guidance, being steered in the right direction, but then still owning all those assets. You're not giving up your IP. You're not giving up a share of your royalties, et cetera, which sounds like a smart uh, business investment for, for people, right? Because, you know, they're not hooked in forever, you know, seven years locked in sort of uh, <laughs> sharing exactly. royalties, et cetera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I, I chafe against that as somebody who values her freedom. Okay. <laughs> <Do you think? laughs> 
<laughs> so you must have clients that have come back because they had a really great experience and they wanted to uh, they wanted to do other project projects. What's the feedback? yeah? The running joke is come for the audiobook, stay for everything else. Okay. So. <laughs> 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 now, uh, so many great things of value. I mean, I've learned so much from you in, in, in our chat today, as well as just through our previous correspondence. But one of the things that just blows my mind and makes my life so much easier as an interviewer is you sent me this amazing three-page PDF. Uh, it was called Interview Resources and Information for Tina Dietz. And, and in it, you even showed me or told me how to pronounce Dietz. It's D-I-E-T-Z. So a uh, you know, because Lafave is one of those names that you'll never pronounce right? correctly, no exactly. matter how you. Do it. So, um, I mean, that alone is worth gold. But you have all this great stuff. Where did where did that originate? This this great content. Well, in my own experience as an interview and as a podcaster, both as a guest and as a host, uh, there's a really standard set of information that you look for as a host, both to build an episode with somebody as well as be able to put together the show notes and promote the episode. So I decided to create what I called an interview resources document, which is a little bit like a media kit, but not. It's okay. specific to podcasting. And it has every piece of information a podcaster could possibly want or need about that guest. And so my hosts, the people, any podcast hosts I've seen are like, oh my God, this is the most amazing document ever because it makes your life easier. And it also makes it a lot easier on the guest as well because you're not constantly reinventing, retyping, you know, all the information. You can just keep it updated as things shift and change for you or even have different versions. Uh, for example, I have a one for speaking on audio like I am now. I have a different document when I'm speaking about leadership and vocal leadership. So it's a little, it's nice to be able to, to do some different things. Um, around, around my company, it's known as uh, interview med, the interview Mad Libs document because we, we, <laughs> when we work with authors and pull out the information from them, it's all, we fill in the blanks so that oh, they okay. have a document that works for them. Oh, and that's it's, so handy. it's a nice precursor to a media kit. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it really is valuable because I can see, you know, a version of this going to a, a radio host who often don't have time to prepare their, you know, right. guest after guest after guest. And, and it's kind of like, okay, I have two minutes between you know, uh, commercials to figure out who's next and what we're going to talk about. Uh, that is fantastic. Um, so where can, uh, where can people find out more about you and check out uh, the services that you offer to authors, publishers, and, and other professionals? Yeah, um, the main website is a kind of a long URL. It's start something creative biz solutions.com. And no one can ever remember that. So the easiest way to reach us is start something positive.com. Start something positive. Start something positive.com. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and I do on. have uh, a whole slew of wonderful links that I will include in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Tina, thank you so much for the inspiration, the guidance, and uh, and again, uh, we'll include links to all those resources. Thanks for hanging out with me today. That's my pleasure, Mark. Anytime. Thanks. I know I mentioned this in the interview, but I want to bring it up again because it really strikes me as important the preparedness and professionalism that Tina showed. Now, I love that when I scheduled my chat with Tina, she provided me with this PDF overview that had a ton of great information that just made my job as an interview so much easier. It was a delight. It not only had her name, it included the pronunciation of her last name, spelled D-I-E-T-Z, but pronounced D-E-E-T-Z, Dietz. It was fantastic. It had contact information, had her social media links, it had a short bio, and it also had a list of general questions I could ask, um, audiobook-specific questions and podcast questions and general questions. It was fantastic. Basically, it was everything that an interviewer, a radio or a podcast host might need to easily prepare for an interview, not to mention the ease uh, for me being able to compile the show notes and the links to accompany the show notes for the podcast. It was awesome. And again, this is professionalism and preparedness. It's a delight to work with a guest like Tina because she makes it that much easier for me to look good. <laughs> Consider this for your own author experience. Do you have a media kit or a one sheet like this that contains all the fields that a potential podcast or radio host might need to prepare for an interview with you? 
Now, because I wanted to give you something handy, I took some time to draft a basic template similar to the one that Tina shared with me, and I posted it as a Word document, which uh, has some samples in it, but um, is mostly empty, so you can fill it out. You can download this from the show notes at starkreflections.ca, and it contains many of the fields that you can use to quickly create your own. Um, heck, if you end up being a guest on this podcast, I'd love to get something like that in advance of our interview. Well, that's it for episode 42. Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you enjoy the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast, please feel free to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice or to share it with another writer that you think would benefit from the content. Thanks again for listening, and until I see you in episode 43 next week, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.